Uh, I would just like to say uh, thank you very much to Colin for inviting me to be part of this evening. Uh, because of, of doing this, I've had the opportunity to read a few chapters of the book um, in advance and I've hugely enjoyed them and I'm, I'm hugely looking forward to, to the rest of it. And I'm investing in a, a fortified coffee table to take the right. Um, because Colin, as you will probably know, combines a fine style with um, a great empathy with the musicians and uh, God Between Us on All Harm, the vibe. Um, and he wears his erudition very lightly. And what I've read so far is a succession of surprises and delights. And it is a great joy to read. So I wish him all the best with it and i um, honoured to have been asked to take part in, which is something that I, I think you will all agree has been a, an evening of impressively fine music making. Um, so uh, thank you very much. <laughs> for the so much joy. It's been a joy to listen to. So here we go. This is extract four. On August 17th and 18th, 1973, the Mahavishnu Orchestra played two triumphant shows to 10,000 people each night at New York's Central Park. Tellingly, perhaps, one reviewer noted that John, unlike previous New York gigs, made a special point of introducing each of the other band members before they began their set. A writer from Crawdaddy magazine, the improbably named Patrick Snyder Scumpy, was taking, that's very Monty Python, <clears throat> was taking the opportunity of the shows two nights in one place to conduct in-depth interviews with all five members. With recent studio sessions in London having been blighted by interpersonal trauma, it had been decided instead to record the new material in concert. A single LP, Between Nothingness and Eternity, resulted. Released in the US in December, in a sleeve design referencing infinity with a star field, it would be the little-known Canadian alternative sleeve a fuzzy but evocative photograph of the tiny figures of the band on stage against the backdrop of the vast New York skyline at night that captured the reality, not infinity, but a moment in time and place. It was a moment that perhaps inexorably was coming to an end. During a flight to Japan in September, where the Mahavishnu Orchestra had a series of seven concerts, John's eyes were fixed on a transcript of Snyder Scumpy's Endeavours for Crawdaddy. The magazine, which would feature John in lotus position on the cover and the immortal strap line, Mahavishnu and the orchestra, not quite guruving, was not yet in the shops, but it mattered not. The fractures everyone had been skirting around for some months were there with speech marks for all to see. They have made music that is probably the most significantly innovative to reach a mass audience since the halcyon days of the Beatles, Scumpy had written. One hopes for a brighter future and continued growth, but even if it all ended tomorrow, an awestruck gratitude would linger for the special wonder of the Mahavishnu Orchestra. Everyone interviewed had expressed hopes and aspirations regarding the band and the future. Four of the five had nevertheless been open about the problems. Snyder Scumpy's eulogising had become, in effect, a eulogy. That, said Billy, was the beginning of the end. Over two editions of Britain's New Musical Express back in July, Ian MacDonald had taken stock of John McLaughlin's career thus far, from a time when he, quote, had a reputation for being one of the remotest and most difficult people to work with in London, unquote, to his current status as a hero who bestrides the world of the electric guitar like a solitary colossus. Ridiculous speed is the transcendental essence of McLaughlin's recent work with the Mahavishnu Orchestra, he wrote. The fastest passages on their albums are now being played so swiftly in concert that the ear has difficulty in separating bars, let alone notes. This, in purely musical terms, means that in about six months' time, the orchestra will be no more than a shrill oral blur, with the members fading visibly into hyperspace, like Captain Kirk in the transporter room of the Starship Enterprise. At this stage, it was difficult for anyone to cling on. McDonald's time scale to oblivion was uncannily prescient. Two of the band, Jan Hammer and Jerry Goodman, were no longer on speaking terms with John. 
each side as entrenched as the other. Armed with the knowledge that this was a train hurtling off a cliff at breakneck velocity, the modern day listener to sound engineer Dinky Dawson's thankfully preserved recordings of latter day concerts might be tempted to hear fury, resentment, rage, and other negative energies in the playing. And that listener might well be right. You can make some great music out of negativity, said John, reflecting on the period five years later, but only for a very limited time. There was still fire in the dying dragon, but it was certainly dying. <clears throat> Two weeks after a television appearance on Don Kirshner's rock concert in November, Billy Cobham had what he later termed a breakdown prior to a show in Atlanta, Georgia. I was very, very upset. I was saying, sure, everything's fine, when in actual fact, all that we had worked for and the effort I had put in personally was more at stake than I wanted to face. I missed a concert. I just didn't go. Billy just stayed in his hotel room, watching a Charles Bronson movie repeatedly on TV. The point was, he said, no one really cared anymore. I don't like it very much, said Ian MacDonald on the live album's January 1974 UK release. They play like maniacs. They play very loudly. It sounds like it was a good thing the band broke up before they attained the speed of light and destroyed the universe. <laughs> the flower has to grow. The universe has to expand, John mused a few months later, innocently adding to the literature of astrophysical references surrounding his music. But before a new era can be born, the old ones got to fall away. Poetically, the cliff's edge was reached with two nights at New York's Avery Fisher Hall on December 27th and 28th. Unfortunately for the symbolism of the New York shows, the band's limit was to be found two nights and 500 miles away on December 30th at Detroit's Masonic Temple. In between, there was a sports arena in Ohio. It was so anticlimactic, said Billy, we played two shows after New York, which is where it all started. We should have finished on a high in New York. Why trudge through the snow to Detroit on New Year's Eve? Come on, who needs it? Pride, that's what ultimately destroyed us, Rick Laird told a reporter from the New York Times. The first year and a half was spent with us battling John's so-called enlightenment <coughs> and him battling our so-called ignorance. We never even said goodbye to each other after the last concert. It all happened so fast, said Jan, with the benefit of hindsight. We were ill-prepared to deal with the complex personal problems that arose. The volume, the intensity, everything combined, it changes you. Towards the end, we used to joke that we were going to need five separate limousines. I think John always meant well, Billy said, a couple of weeks after the split. And he did something bold in a way, because... He went from one extreme completely over to the other side to not smoking, no drugs, totally vegetarian, cleansing his system. And to me, he's an indication of someone trying to find peace of mind and to do what's right. Still, there's one thing I learned. If you want to have a say, just put the band in your name. <laughs> 